It looks like uh, most of us are back. Uh, we're going to talk about fundamental concepts now. <clears throat> so we'll cover uh, time, reference frames, coordinate systems, positions and states, and aberration corrections. <clears throat> this tutorial covers concepts that are going to be later on in further tutorials and in your response lessons. Some of the material is a little bit more difficult than what follows. <clears throat> But a complete understanding of it is not absolutely essential to getting into this class. I do think the information will be helpful, so here we go. An epic in spice terminology is simply distant in time. It's specified by an event of some kind, such as the passage of star across the meridian, uh, in the tick of an atomic clock, close to the spacecraft signal, etc. <coughs> Clocks count epics. Epics specified by events. And a careful specification of epics is required to uh, <coughs> but careful specification of epics requires reference to particular clocks and locations of the, and the location of the clock. What we mean by time systems are agreed upon standards for naming epics, <coughs> measuring time, and synchronizing clocks. So, some of the important time systems, atomic time, it's a statistical time scale. Uh, it's based on data from about uh, 200 atomic clocks in uh, over 50 national laboratories. It's maintained by the IPM. The unit is the SI second. <clears throat> and it's expressed as a count of atomic seconds past the astronomically determined of midnight, January 1st, 1958. Coordinated universal time. This is one of the time systems that's um, used very often in, in uh, spacecraft operations. <clears throat> and uh, it is approximately civil time at Greenwich and one and uses the usual calendar formats, plus hour, minute, and second. Now, TAI and UTC are linked very closely. Uh, UTC plus 10 seconds plus number of each second equals TAI. This relationship is only valid after January 1st, 1972. And I, I should say, there's something a little bit confusing here. Oops, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, right here, the definition of TAI um, uses this reference epic, January 1st, 1958. But this formula is based on having the same reference epic for TAI and UTC. And, and in spice, that epic is the J2000 epic. <clears throat> Astronomical time is measured by the uh, spin of the Earth. It's the uh, hour angle representation of the angle between the Greenwich and the location of the Jupiter and the Sun. And this was used prior to atomic time for civil timekeeping. Now, Earth rotation, or, or uh, UT1, are, is tied to UTC. And these two time systems are not exactly synchronized, but they're kept close together. The, um, when the mismatch between UTC and UT1 becomes larger than, oops, pointer is right in the middle here. When the mismatch between these two becomes larger than 0 0.9 atomic seconds, a leap second is added or removed, although there never has been a negative leap second historically, at the end of the designated UTC day. <coughs> Variations in Earth's rotation cause, that cause leap seconds uh, to, to be needed are not predictable. This is why SPICE uses a leap seconds kernel. You'll see later on that we have a tabulation of leap seconds. And when a new one is declared by the IDRS, we add one to the leap seconds kernel. So here's what the sequence of time tags looks like when a leap seconds occurs. Um, here's the normal sequence of times at the end of the year, in this case, uh, 1998. <coughs> And with a positive leap second, you see that there's actually another, um, another second added here. And there is actually a time string that has 60 in the uh, seconds place, representing the beginning of the leap second. And then one second later, we have the beginning of January 1st of the next year. With, if there were a negative leap second, the last second of, of the year, last second of the day, the, case of seconds added at the end of the year ends with the, the uh, 59 seconds. So it starts at 58, and when the second completes, it's then January 1st, 
zero seconds. Now, these seconds <coughs> commonly give a task of computing duration. When you've got two UTC times, it isn't obvious how much time is, has actually transpired between those two UTC times. And, it, and if those times are in the past, you need to know what leap seconds occurred between them to know how much, what the actual duration was. <coughs> if there, uh, if there is a uh, future UTC time and it is beyond a point where the first point where a loop second could be added, you also don't know how many seconds it will be until that UTC time actually occurs. So durations in UTCs don't mix very well, but UTCs nonetheless is a very popular system for the sort of work that we do and it's important to deal with, to deal with it. Um, understanding loop seconds is part of that. <coughs> There is a dynamic time is another very important system in SPICE. It is the uh, mathematical ideal using the equations of motion. So this is it's the uh, independent time variable for many SPICE serpentine interfaces. And it's also the independent time variable for SPK files of the SPICE memory files. <coughs> it's related to very centric coordinate time uh, by an offset and scale factor. And it advances, on average, at very close to the same rate as TAI. The difference is nearly periodic. Terrestrial dynamical time is uh, closely related to barycentric dynamical time, and it's closely related to TAI. It's, it's actually TAI plus 32.184 seconds. Uh, we still use this abbreviation TET for terrestrial dynamical time in SPICE, but the guy who has adopted this new TT uh, abbreviation. So just synonyms. <coughs> TDB and TDT have nearly the same reference epic um, about January 1st noon of uh, the year 2000. And TDT and TDB advance at different rates. This is not necessary when you look at these, these time systems at a fairly coarse time scale, uh, but if you look them close up, uh, you'll see that there, there is variation and that cost that can actually cause um, issues with computer programs. Uh, variations are small. The amplitude of the variation is about 1.6 milliseconds. Variations are almost periodic for a period of one sidereal year. And variations are due to relativistic effects. Here, here's the low accuracy formula that is used in SPICE. Uh, this is good to roughly 40 microseconds. <clears throat> we don't use TDT directly in SPICE uh, very much. It is used in s block kernels as the parallel time system to relate um, spacecraft clock readings to a, a uh, standard time system. And it is useful for duration computations involving UGC. So I said just a moment ago that it's hard to work with durations um, to compute durations using UGC, but the way to do it is to convert UGC to terrestrial dynamical time and do a subtraction of the two terrestrial dynamical times. So that, that gives you a way of uh, letting spice do the work of dealing with leap seconds. It won't, won't help you with future times beyond the time where a leap second could be added, um, but for, for any times prior to that and any historical times, you can do accurate duration computations with slice using terrestrial dynamic time. Here's just a graphic that shows the offsets between the time systems. Um, you can see that in a, in a, uh, on a coarse scale, that um, the uh, difference between TDT and TDB doesn't look like much. It looks like a straight line. We have this greatly magnified here. And you can see that there is this periodic variation going on. Um, the difference between uh, TAI and TDB is the same as this difference here, but it is, it is adjusted by 32.184 seconds. Then we have this very small amplitude variation that we can't see. And then we look at the difference between T and UTC and TDB. We see that UTC is falling further and further behind TDB in a stepwise fashion over time. The uh, time scale here is you know, on the horizontal axis of the years past J2000. So every time a leap second is added, UTC falls further behind. And um, we're, we're now at roughly, I think, a uh, difference of something like 68, 69 seconds. Um, SPICE is, is for the uh, WebGeoCalc uh, program that Boris mentioned is a good way to find that out almost instantly. 
it's a bit hard to see the GDP from find that out. <coughs> so the spacecraft clock is another time system that the spice deals with. The formats of the representations of time uh, vary from clock to clock, from mission to mission. Uh, for the Cassini, uh, there's a, uh, here's a sample of Cassini string. You have a one and a slash, and then the large number of counts, and uh, the uh, maximum reading for the fractional part of the, uh, of the string. The first part of this, the one is a partition number. Partitions are, are uh, a, uh, a feature that SPICE um, supports. It's not, not uh, standard across missions. It's, uh, it's not standard across uh, any other systems outside of SPICE. But um, partitions identify time periods in which clock operate continuously. If there's a discontinuity in the clock, say, you know, we set to zero or jumps ahead or, or jump or reset uh, to some other value, the uh, partition changes. This gives you a way of uniquely identifying the, uh, the actual time that corresponds to a given clock. Because a given clock rate can occur in multiple partitions. In this, this uh, sample you can see string here, uh, this is a count of seconds. And this is a count of what we call ticks. These are the smallest unit of time measurable by the clock. For Galileo, here's another, another uh, format. We have a partition, slash, the most significant field, uh, and three more fields. This is the moon count, mod 91 count, RGI count, and mod 8 count. Uh, these, these formats, the information that, that describes them, is all included in the SPICE spacecraft clock kernel for the mission that has that clock. Um, spacecraft clock is used to timestamp data. Uh, in SPICE terminology, the fundamental unit of time is the tick. That's the smallest increment possible for the clock. And the nominal decoration is spacecraft clock dependence. So many clocks have 1 per 56 of a second as the tick. Uh, for the Galileo clock, it was 1 per 127 of a second. Sorry, 1 per 20th of a second, and, and so on. It's not standardized. The duration of ticks drifts with respect to other time systems. Uh, the spacecraft clocks are not very stable. Um, okay, so let's move on to frames and coordinate systems. Boris mentioned this, we're coming back to it now. Reference frame is ordered set of three uh, orthogonal direction vectors, or basis vectors, if you like, of a uh, vector space. And these uh, set of three vectors are coupled with a location called frame center or origin. We, we frequently use the shorthand frame instead of reference frame. And, uh, the set of ordered, the ordered set of axes is also called a basis. Now, a coordinate system, by contrast, is, is uh, a specification of the method of locating a point within a reference frame. So here you see some familiar coordinate systems, Cartesian coordinates and spherical coordinates. Outside of spice, um, unfortunately, these two terms are often mixed. You often see the, the, the terminology uh, coordinate frame. We don't use that in SPICE. And, and when you do see coordinate frame, that's what, what SPICE calls a reference frame. The set of the reference frame actually <coughs> plays fairly little, um, little of a role in SPICE. Um, <coughs> it coincides with the origin of the frame. Um, in the case of the IAU frames, these are the body fixed frames that Boris mentioned. Uh, the, uh, Origin coincides with the center of mass of the object. The center of all inertial frames, by simply by, by um, an arbitrary decision in the SPICE uh, software, is the solar system area center. The, the uh, center could be moved anywhere else and would have no effect on SPICE computations. This is true even for frames that are associated with accelerating bodies, such as Mars IU, the center of Mars IU, which is a a Mars inertial frame is considered to be the solar system very center. 
So in the specification of states, well, I should for, say first of all that in SPICE, uh, states are, are defined as the position of one object relative to another. So that, that way of looking at a vector as having a head and a tail and a direction that points from the tail to the head is used. And <clears throat> the, uh, if you have a vector that, that uh, points from A to B, uh, it doesn't matter whether the center of those vectors is C1 or C2, because the difference between A relative to C1 and B relative to C1 is the same as if you substitute C2 for uh, C1. But the center is used for computing the lifetime of centers of non inertial frames. And this is where the, the center does come in spikes. If you're doing a remote sensing observation and you're, you're computing the orientation of an object that is distant from the observer, the rotation of that object <coughs> at, at the time that's relevant, at the time, say, it, it emitted photons that you captured in a photograph, is going to have been sometime in the past. One has to do a lifetime correction to get the orientation of the object as it was when it emitted those photons. And the center is needed in order to do that. The SPICE uses the center of that, the uh, body fixed reference frame of that target to uh, calculate the lifetime that's needed to calculate the orientation of that body fixed frame. So the bottom line is that um, when you're dealing with aberration corrections, the centers of frames do come into play. <coughs> Uh, there are many types of reference frames using SPICE. Uh, inertial frames, these are non-rotating uh, with respect to big stars, they have non-accelerating origin. Velocity is typically non-zero, but the acceleration is negligible. And main examples, J2000, also called ICRF, and uh, B1950. That bar's eye view that I mentioned on the other, uh, that was on the previous slide, is the other one. And then non-inertial frames, uh, for example, body-fixed frames that are centered at the body center. Um, Top-centered frames are also body-fixed. They're uh, centered at points on the surface of the body. Instrument frames, these are frames uh, associated with, uh, typically with spacecraft instruments, so they could also be instruments on rover, lander, uh, DSM antenna, uh, antenna et cetera. Um, these frames uh, are time-varying. Dynamic frames, for example, frames defined by time-dependent vectors. Again, these are time-varying frames. The J2000 frame is used a great deal in spice. You'll see it referred to again and again in the documentation. And um, the definition is based on the, uh, the uh, ecliptic and, or and uh, equatorial plane of the Earth at a particular epoch, at the J2000 epoch. These planes are defined by simplified mathematical models, namely the 1976 Island Recession model is used to define these, these, um, the orientation of these frames. And that model is evaluated exactly at the J2000 epoch. It gives you the orientation of the, uh, what we call the uh, mean Earth equator and equinox uh, reference frame. So J2000 is that that the equinox and the equator reference frame evaluated at the J2000 epoch. You can see that the, the uh, equatorial plane of the Earth, as given by that model, is the xy plane of the frame. We use the axis as normal to that. And the um, plot positive x-axis is the ascending node, the ecliptic plane on that equatorial plane. ICRF is a frame that's very close to orientation to J2000. Mm -hmm. It's uh, defined by adopted locations of extragalactic radio sources. <coughs> and um, this is what is actually used in SPICE almost everywhere that J2000 is mentioned. So ICRF differs by very small rotation, uh, less than a tenth of our second from J2000. Um, SPICE treats these two frames as synonymous, but really, when we say J2000, we're referring to the ICRF, except in a few places which are, are not, not significant for this class. So, in SPK files, in, in uh, binary PCK files, and all the work that you'll be doing, J2000 is just a mislabeling of ICRF. ICRF is the actual frame that we're using. So you, don't, you don't need to ask 
the splice provided transformation between ISRF and J2000 because you want to do that conversion. You don't need it. You're already working in the ICRF when you're using splice J2000. Body fixed frames are tied to the main body and rotate with it. Uh, most common things are those for the uh, frames associated with natural bodies. And uh, as we'll see later, we have orientation data for these bodies uh, that have come from an IMU publication. So the, um, that, that's the origin of the name IU underscore body name, which is used for these frames. For example, IU Mars and IU Saturn. To see all such names, you'll look at the frames for prior reading or latest generic piece of game file. Rotation state, orientation at time t, is usually determined using a splice text PCK containing data published by the IMU. Earth and Moon are special cases. Um, IMU, Earth and IMU Moon do exist, <coughs> and they, they uh, can be used for low accuracy work. But we say that they generally should not be used because they are not very accurate. Um, the splice tutorial named Lunar Earth PCK FK um, identifies the frames that are the best used for the Earth and uh, and um, although PCKs are normally used for body orientation, um, in some instances a CK is used. Uh, Comet CG uh, is one example where the uh, flexibility of the C kernel was really needed in order to accurately, accurately represent the body orientation. Top eccentric frames are attached to a surface. Um, the Z axis is parallel to the gravity gradient or orthogonal to a reference steroid. Put point up or down in this particular example, we have it pointing up. Um, azimuth is typically measured clockwise from the plus x axis, although uh, there are other definitions of azimuth. <coughs> and in this case, elevation uh, is uh, measured upward to the, from the xy plane to the uh, plus z axis. But again, um, the uh, ele elevation can be measured positive in the downward direction. Uh, some conventions for coordinate systems, uh, for planetocentric coordinate systems, for planets and satellites, the plus the axis always points to the north side of the empirical plane of the solar system. So the, the empirical plane is the plane that's normal to the angular momentum vector of the solar system. Planetocentric longitude increases positively eastward, and planetocentric latitude increases positively northward. So that's true for the planets and their satellites. We can see that there, there are some exceptions here, um, objects that do not fall into this category, dwarf planets, asteroids, and comets, are said to spin in the right-hand sense about their positive pole. So this terminology is, is used instead of north. Um, we still call the positive pole the north pole in splice documentation, but this is somewhat uh, deprecated language. A positive pole can point above or below the variable plane. So while well, we always say that um, the plus the axis points above the variable plane for planets and satellites, that's not the case for small objects. And this is a fairly recent revision in the history of IU. Uh, well, recent is well the term. Uh, 2006, this decision inverted what had been in the direction north for Pluto, uh, Carol, and, and Ida. And the splice routines that deal with Pluto center coordinates are rec lap, that's for rectangular to Latitudinal coordinate inverse lap rec, rab rec, and rec rad for r in the deck to rectangular and rectangular to r in the deck. And then the derivative routines, derivative of rectangular with respect to latitudinal and derivative of latitudinal with respect to rectangular. Plinino Dedic coordinate systems use a different definition of latitude. Longitude is still measured positively eastward. Uh, but latitude is tied to a reference ellipsoid. And for a point on a reference ellipsoid, the latitude is the angle measured from the xy plane to the surface normal, the point of interest. For other points, the latitude is the latitude of the nearest point on the reference ellipsoid. Latitude increases positively in the plus the direction, and longitude works the same way as planetocentric longitude. The planetodetic routines are rect, geo, geo, rec, DR, DGO, and DGO, DR for derivatives. 
And although these, we can use geo, as in geodetic, these are not tied to the Earth. The uh, parameters of the reference spheroid are inputs to these machines, and they can be used for linear-odetic coordinates for any object. Lamino graphic coordinate systems are similar to Lamino Dedic, but longitude is defined differently. Uh, the, um, longitude is usually defined so the sub observer longitude increases with time, as seen by distant fixed observer in an inertial reference frame. So this works the way that, that astronomers would have liked it to work, uh, or probably did like it to work, for Mars observations made from Earth. Um, from telescopes, where the sub Earth meridian increases with time, and it's convenient to say that, that longitude is the uh, <coughs> increases in the positively in the uh, westward direction because the, uh, that way longitude increases with time. Um, but this is it's it's less convenient as you have spacecraft uh, observing. Uh, from different bodies from, from uh, all, all different uh, points of, of reference. Um, and um, we recommend that you do not try to use planetographic coordinates for dwarf planets, asteroids, and comets. Um, for one thing, there are multiple inconsistent standards. Um, and this, this idea of uh, observation with a remote, from, as seen by a remote observer, is not particularly relevant. But we do have routines for uh, converting between planetographic and other coordinate systems. Um, the, um, so, so here we sorry here we have um, routines that we recommend for using for small bodies. These, these are uh, for planetodetic or planetocentric <coughs> coordinates. But here we have routines that do work with planetographic coordinates. It's PGR rec, planetographic to rectangular, and rec PGR rectangular planetographic. Okay, so I mentioned state vectors and the idea of having a, a, a tail ahead of the vector. Um, in, in spice terminology, we frequently talk about a vector pointing um, from a, a, an observer to a target. <coughs> um, we have uh, talked about Saturn relative to the Saturn Very Center, Titan relative to the Huygens probe. So in, in these cases, we have uh, state vectors that are defined by two objects. <clears throat> if we talk, if we talk about the position of Saturn relative to the Saturn Vera Center, then we're talking about a vector that points from the Vera Center to Saturn. Now, in the SDK subsystem, what we call a state is a six-dimensional vector. It's got three Cartesian position components, x, y, and z, and then the next components are Cartesian velocity, the x, t, y, and t, z. Units are always kilometers and kilometers per second, and the, the seconds here is always uh, very centric dynamical time, TDD. States are always specified relative to a reference frame. Uh, to transform states, uh, first of all, to perform algebraic operations on states, they have to be the same reference frame. Uh, position only transformations require only a location matrix, that's a 3 by 3 matrix. Uh, given as a function of time. So you, if you have got uh, two reference frames, A and B, you can, and uh, position specified relative to A, you can obtain the position specified relative to B by just left multiplying by a rotation matrix uh, that uh, connects A to B. For velocity transformations, you have to differentiate this relationship with respect to time, and so we have got uh, two terms on the right hand side. The, the uh, velocity in uh, our object in the uh, B frame is the uh, derivative of the rotation times the position plus the rotation times the derivative of the position. And uh, we use a 6 by 6 matrix to combine these two transformations into a single equation. So here are the, the uh, vectors, the transformations. And, uh, Here our, our terminology is S sub i is position and velocity, so this is a column vector. You can get the uh, state by, trans by applying plus multiplying the state in system A by the transformation from A to B. Okay, this is the state relative 
of the state expressed in system B. And here's what our transformation matrix looks like. It has the rotation from A to B in the upper left and lower right um, blocks, uh, zero block in the upper right, and it has the derivative block in the lower left. Now there's spice routines for doing this. You don't have to memorize all this. Um, the spice routine is SX4 and the X4, return state transformation and position transformation matrices respectively. So SX4 gives you this six by six matrix, and PX4 gives you this three by three matrix. Okay, so uh, we'll move on to aberration corrections. I mentioned earlier lifetime correction. Uh, there are actually two kinds of aberration corrections that SPICE deals with, both lifetime and uh, stellar aberration. <clears throat> and these aberration corrections are used to describe the, the uh, apparent position and orientation of an object as opposed to the actual position and orientation at a given time. So these, these, these aberration corrections come into play for remote sensing observations where it takes a significant amount of time for light to travel or radiation to travel from the target to the observing spacecraft. Aberration correction is also used for the inverse sort of trans uh, transmission of radiation uh, for, for computing where a target is going to be if you want to radiate to that target or in what direction you have to point radiation in order for it to arrive at the target. So, Aberration corrections can be used to answer questions to accurately, I should say, answer questions such as in which direction must the remote sensing instrument be pointed to observe a target of interest? For given pointing direction and observation time, what target body surface location would be observed by a remote sensing instrument? In which direction must an antenna be pointed to transmit a signal to a specified target? In order to compute an aberration corrected state, state vectors using computation must all be chained back to the solar system very center. Now, this is a very important point to start actually working with SPICE and doing your own aberration corrections, or you should say computing your own state vectors using aberration corrections. Because what will happen is if you don't have all of the data needed to connect your objects to the solar system very center, you're going to get a SPICE error. SPICE will say, say it doesn't have enough data available to perform the computation that you requested. So here in this case, we've got a spacecraft, which has uh, it, it's, uh, in the interplanetary cruise. We need to be able to get its position and velocity relative to the solar system very center. Note the solar system very center is not the center of the sun. It's, it's typically uh, close to the surface of the sun, um, you know, outside of, in most cases, outside of the sun. Um, and here we have our target, and we need to be able to connect the target to the solar system area center, so we have to connect it to the Saturnian system mass center, and then that down to the solar system area center. Here's an example of how aberration corrections are used. So here we have an example where we're, we're, going, to, we're going to contrast what happens when we compare a predicted photo to an actual photo using no aberration correction, lifetime correction alone, and lifetime plus stellar, stellar aberration. In these, these uh, drawings, the um, red uh, graphics are supposed to be overlays that show the <coughs> predicted photograph. And then what's drawn in color, you know, with this, this black image where the, uh, the star are uh, supposed to represent an actual photograph. So if we if we were meant to make predicted photograph without using aberration corrections and then compare it to the actual photograph, so we overlay overlay the predict on the actual photograph, we see this mismatch. The star location is wrong, the position of this target object is wrong, and its orientation is wrong. We have this object that has craters that appear near the, the limb on the left side, and in our, our predict, they were here closer to the right side. So we get all these things wrong by not using aberration. If we were to turn on lifetime correction, we see a little bit better correspondence. Uh, but we have not improved the star prediction at all. But the orientation of the target object is, has improved. And the predicted position of the target object has improved. Well, it's changed in any case. When we turn on stellar aberration corrections, we actually get a much better correspondence. It's not perfect because there would be other sources of error that were not modeling by uh, doing the aberration 
So in detail, um, what happens when we simply have a, uh, a predict that does not use aberration corrections? Well, we're, we're going to look up the state of the target, its position and, and, and uh, orientation in this case. Um, where it is at the time photons were received at the observer? That's not the position and orientation where the photons were emitted. And when the photograph records, it's position and orientation at the time the photons were emitted. So we made a, we made a, a major mistake in, in uh, choosing the epic, which will look up the data. And that's, that, that's what accounts for uh, a large mismatch between the position of this large target and its orientation. And in the case of the star image, it's, it's the fact that we didn't do a stellar aberration correction that um, accounts for this mismatch. Now, one doesn't do lifetime corrections for um, stars. Lifetime is not modeled, and the, the, uh, all, all the positions of stars are given in the star catalog, in a sense, are already lifetime corrected because we're only, caught, we're only giving the positions in the catalog of the, the uh, apparent position of the star. Or the light appears to be coming from. Okay, so how, do, how are lifetime corrections performed? Well, let's, let's imagine that our target object is moving along this path. In the uh, original left hand diagram, we looked up the position of the target at this moment. This is where this is why we circle this in red. Um, <coughs> And so we, we calculated that the direction vector of the target pointed from our observer location to this point. If we turn on lifetime corrections, then we get, we, we get or Spice will give you, the position of the target as it was one lifetime prior to the, the reception time. Here's the observer's position at time et. et is our reception time. The light traveled from this position to Observer position in LT seconds. And if we back up the position of the target along its own path by LT seconds, we get this position here. This is lifetime corrected position. This is the position that the object appears to be at when you photograph it. Similarly, the um, spin of the object, we're, we're in this diagram, is supposed to be in the right hand sense of, of about this, this arrow. And so when we back up the orientation of the object by one light time, the object is going to appear rotated in the clockwise sense. It, it, it's actually, as time goes forward, it's rotating in the counterclockwise sense. So when we back it up in time, its orientation is going to be rotated clockwise. And that's what accounts for the, the um, movement of these craters from the right-hand side to the left-hand side of the image. Now in this, in this drawing, the angular separation of uh, geometric and correct and lifetime correct positions has been increased greatly to make the, the uh, diagram readable. Normally, the angle between these two vectors is pretty small. And once again, the camera actually sees the target's position and orientation at ET minus LT. We have observation time corrected by one way lifetime. Okay, so applying the corrections, uh, we moved the object, we moved the object uh, back in time along its orbit, and that gave us a new estimated position, that which accounts for the location of this, this um, overlay. And the orientation of the overlay has changed because we backed up the, the rotation of the object to its uh, estimated orientation at, at uh, ET minus L. We've got better, but not, not the big correspondence. If we add stellar aberration corrections, that's going to amount to a shift of the apparent position in, the, in, a, in a direction that is parallel to the component of the observer's velocity relative to the solar system very center. So if we, if we uh, say that the observer's velocity relative to the solar system very center is this direction, and the component of that vector that is orthogonal to the line of sight, the lifetime corrected position, is this vector. It is this vector that determines how much stellar aberration correction we need to apply. Stellar aberration correction always shifts the apparent position 
in the direction of this component of the vector. And again, once again, that's the, the portion of the observer's velocity relative to the solar system very center that's orthogonal to the line of sight, that component. And so that results in a shift, and we have the, we start out with uh, the uh, estimated lifetime corrected position, and now we shift it by the cellular aberration direction, and we get, we get the apparent orientation. And when we apply that, our image looks a lot better, and we can also apply that same cellular aberration direction to our predicted star image, and we get a, a, a prediction that's a lot closer to the actual uh, position when the star showed up in our photograph. Now, there are many other possible causes of errors, pointing error, timing error, space rocket target, target and ephemeris errors. Uh, all these will, will contribute to, excuse me, uh, all these will contribute to a less than perfect estimate even after we've made these aberration corrections. The, so the stellar aberration correction may seem a little bit mysterious. Um, it is sometimes described as a relativistic effect, but I should emphasize that for the sorts of computations we're doing, it is really the first order part of it, which is non-relativistic, which gives you a good estimate of the correction. We're talking about speeds that are very, very small compared to the speed of light. So let's say a spacecraft, a, a fast moving spacecraft might be moving 100 kilometers per second relative to the solar system very center. Um, 30 kilometers per second relative to the solar system center is the, roughly the speed of the Earth. So we're, we're, talk, we're talking about um, relative scale compared to the speed of light of one part in 10,000, maybe one part in 3,000. Um, these are all very, very small velocities compared to light scale and uh, light, sorry, light speed scale. And so we can, we can effectively explain stellar aberration by pretending that relativity doesn't exist and that photons just act like, like uh, baseballs, for example, and that we can do simple vector addition of velocities and get good estimates of the uh, direction of radiation travel. That's what, that's what we're doing with these uh, diagrams here. Um, we've got an observer here at ET minus LT. But this this uh, indicates a, a, a camera. We have a, a, a target here. We have a photon path, and this is all in the solar system very center reference range. We have a photo, photon path going from the target in this direction, this horizontal direction, and our observer is moving in this direction, and there's an intersection right here. Now, the thing that's a little bit strange in this diagram is we have our camera pointed at an angle. And it's not obvious that it's going to be able to capture a photon um, coming from the target because it doesn't look like it's pointed in the direction of the uh, radiation it's, it's uh, coming from. But in the observer reference frame, we see that the path of the photons in the, uh, in the frame fixed the observer is along this diagonal. And this camera is pointed in exactly the right direction to capture the photons. Now, the, the, rel the relative sizes of these legs of the triangle are, are roughly V here, where V is the, the, observe, the, uh, the magnitude of the observer velocity. Uh, v times LT is roughly with this magnitude, and C times LT is roughly this magnitude. So we've got a, we've got a, a very roughly speaking, a triangle that is, is, uh, has ratios of V to C uh, for the two not hypotenuse legs. And this is very crude, and yet it's, it's quite accurate for the sorts of computations that you're going to do with spies, because V over C is so small. In fact, one thing you might ask right away is, well, so we're looking at, aren't we looking at a special case? We've got velocity, per, velocity relative to the solar system very center of the observer orthogonal to the line of sight. Well, that's a special case. That almost never occurs. Why would it be worthwhile to analyze this particular geometry. Well, the fact is that as long as this velocity is extremely small compared to C, that this, the triangle almost always looks like this regardless of the observer velocity. If the observer velocity, say, is a thousand times greater in the horizontal direction, or maybe not a thousand times greater, but let's say uh, 10 times greater or 100 times greater in the horizontal direction, 
Uh, v over C is still very small. And so the, the shape of this triangle hasn't changed very much. So this, this is actually a pretty good way of thinking about um, why does cellular evaporation occur at all and what, what is the magnitude of the fraction? What is the uh, apparent geometry as the observer sees it of this incoming photon path? So thinking of this as a triangle with lengths of length uh, V times LT and C times LT is a pretty good model. Here's some examples. Now, everything I've been talking about applies to remote sensing. It doesn't apply to in situ observations. And even for remote sensing, it's, it's important for accurate work. It's not important for low accuracy work. All these effects tend to be pretty small. Uh, here, here are some examples of actual aberration pressure for flying missions. Um, in this case, we're looking at uh, Mars, the signal from Mars, the Mars Express Orbiter, and the difference between the, the, uh, uh, the these are the angular offsets between the position vectors when, when a lifetime gets cell, er, cell aeration are both used and when no correction is used. So the, the biggest correction in this case is slightly under a millimeter. Um, lifetime versus none, um, we see some large differences. Uh, Earth is seen from Mars, Mars Express, again, we have a few thousandths of a degree, again, but going up to as big as a hundredth of a degree, and so forth. Uh, Mars Express is seen from Earth. Again, yeah, hundredth of degree is our biggest difference. Sun is seen from Mars. Um, with uh, lifetime only, you see that there's no almost uh, there is no visible correction at this scale at all. Uh, that's because the sun doesn't move very fast relative to the solar system very center, so backing it up by one lifetime doesn't do much. And uh, however, cell aberration is the dominant effect when you're when you're looking at the sun, and it's not necessarily a trivial scale. Again, uh, these are, are uh, aberration correction scales that apply to the CME. We see the same um, maximum um, offsets here, Earth is seen from the CME, about 100 of a degree. Uh, similarly, the CME is seen from Earth. And uh, again, the Sun has uh, no lifetime correction at all, virtually, and uh, stellar aberration is the dominant effect. Now, something to keep in mind is that for most orbiters, uh, the spacecraft and the target body are moving close to parallel to the relative to the solar system and center. So both these effects are especially small for orbiters. If you have a low Mars orbiter, in particular, um, actually not using stellar aberration, uh, sorry, not using either lifetime or stellar aberration, it uh, gives you a fairly reasonable estimate. And one thing you can easily do when you're, in, when you're working in your code lessons is try turning off uh, light time and solar aberration and see how much your answers change. Okay, I think that is the end of it. Yes? Okay.